and so I appreciate you willing to do this. Yeah, no worries. Yeah. All right, just go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us about your uh, your dog life journey. Hi, um, I'm Christine Robinson. Um, we live in Southern California, my husband and I, Stuart, and we've got uh, Black Russian Terriers. Um, both of us have had dogs um, most of our entire lives. I've had them most of my adult life. Um, transition from black uh, from Dobermans for me um, to the Black Russian Terrier after about 20 years with Dobermans and kind of used to a working dog temperament. Um, had herding dogs growing up and we did breed Australian Shepherds. But this is you know, back in the 80s where we didn't do a lot of health testing and uh, basically if a dog had a sound temperament and it could work, then you would breed it. And if it didn't, then uh, it was somebody's pet. And uh, it's come a long way since then. And I'm excited about a lot of the changes that we have in canine health overall. Um, I did transition into Dobermans because I enjoy uh, that working temperament. Um, I did like the herding breeds, but a little too fast for me as I'm getting older. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so uh, the Dobermans uh, have a significant number of health problems. And they've been bred down a lot. Um, a lot of the show lines are not nearly as robust and strong as, as some of the working lines had been, and there was such a discrepancy. Um, I decided to make a change in the early 2000s and um, did a research at the time, looking at a few different reasons for settling on Black Rock Terrier uh, about 2007, and it took me two years to get my first dog. Wow. Could you uh, talk about what that final decision was to uh, pursue the Black Russian Terrier? Sure. Um, initially, uh, wanting another kind of working dog temperament um, with that guard protection um, aspect, we looked at the Giant Schnauzer and we looked at the Bouvier. Um, coincidentally, the Giant Schnauzer is one of the foundation breeds for Rottweiler, or for uh, Black Russian Terriers, mm -hmm. along with Rottweiler and the Air Terrier. Um, the Bouvier is completely different. It is a herding breed, but it does have a very good guardian instinct. And we have friends with Bouviers liked their temperament a lot. Um, the harsh coat and the amount of grooming was a little bit of a deterrent and then I ended up with a black Russian that required even more grooming so I'm not sure what I was thinking there huh. but um, I think when it came down to uh, mostly for us is meeting the black Russian terrier in person um, it is a large commitment and, and I mean that it's a large dog as well but it's mm -hmm. a large commitment um, to training and maintenance particularly for the coat even if you're not keeping a dog in a show coat, there's a lot of coat maintenance that is required. But um, the Giant Schnauzer was a little bit smaller um, than the Black Russian and didn't have quite as um, an imposing appearance, even though it's quite impressive. It wasn't quite as imposing as the um, Black Russian uh, mm -hmm. visually. Um, the Bouvier had a little more energy than I was looking for, and the Giant Schnauzer had a little bit more energy than I was looking for. It's, it's funny to say that when, when you know that Black Russian Terrier has the word terrier in the name, and it's nothing like a terrier, or shouldn't be anything like a terrier. Mm -hmm. um, that energy level, um, the shape of a terrier, that compact uh, back and those sort of things do run more towards a giant schnauzer and the black Russian really isn't like that um, the word terrier in their name comes from the fact that they had Airedale Terrier mm -hmm. um, in the beginning um, of starting that breed so uh, kind of looking at the different components that went into the dog um, we were excited with the combination of those four main breeds um, they had added in the Newfoundland a little bit later um, but the giant schnauzer, being strong, fearless, uh, robust, um, didn't really pay too much attention to the coat, but that does come into play. Um, loved the Rottweiler aspect. Um, not a hyperactive dog. Definitely a strong, loyal guard breed with a strong jaw, very intelligent, 
um, has endurance, a little bit different, um, even while well, have changed over the decades um, than you see some of the Rotties today. Um, the Airedale Terrier being in there, highly trainable, highly intelligent, giving that courage um, and intelligence to the breed. But when they added in that Newfoundland, I feel like that was the good balance um, where they did get a better temperament. Um, interesting parts about adding the Newfoundland in came with a lot more coat maintenance. Um, mm-hmm. We sometimes will see some of the black tongues or spots on the black tongues or on the tongues of black. Um, webbed feet, very strong swimmers, and it was kind of that combination of all of them um, that put together sort of for me that perfect dog. It's it is big, but it's not a giant breed. Mm-hmm. It's still large, um, but it's robust and strong. Uh, definitely reliable for working and can work independently to the, to the degree that. Some people might not like that it decides to do certain things <laughs> without permission. Mm-hmm. But if you don't keep it busy, it's going to make decisions to work. So, um, But highly intelligent, highly trainable. There's not much that the black Russian can't do. Um, there's some things it doesn't like to do, but there's not much that it couldn't do. Um, very loyal to its family, very protective. Yes, it does require a lot of coat maintenance. We do okay out in his, this height a hot environment southern california it's been really relentlessly hot lately but our dogs live inside as they should mm-hmm. with us um, but they're very very healthy very strong and uh I, I, kind of that combination of all those breeds together put together for us the perfect dog um but i have my expectations set appropriately i think right could you talk about the uh the history of the Black Russian and, and why sure. they were developed? Sure. Um, this is, it is interesting because usually, you know, we consider animal husbandry, you know, with the farms and they all had jobs and things like that. This really was a scientific um, development for Russia. So during the 1940s, and this was uh, after quite a, a very significant war history and a lot of um, devastation throughout their country, um, they were left without a lot of their own natural resources, and that included a working dog that was truly Russian. Mm -hmm. The Red Star um, Kennel was born out of the Red Star Army, and that was the army there in Russia, and their task was to create a strong working dog that would be part of the Russian National Security Force. Um, They didn't have a lot of breeds to work with at that time. Um, A lot of purebred dogs were wiped out. Um, Having a dog was certainly a luxury. And with food sources scarce and other resources scarce, they had to get dogs from Germany, and they did. They imported those dogs and then began breeding to try to create for them that perfect working dog that was versatile and able to withstand um, the severe conditions outside, which included extreme heat and extreme cold, as you can imagine. Mm-hmm. Um, so this this was definitely, I don't want to use the word experiment in a negative way, but it was a military scientific project to create a breed for Russia, for the Red Star Army. And they started breeding true um, by 1958. Of course, they still look quite different than they then than they do now. Mm-hmm. Um, but soon afterwards, um, they were able to release dogs to private breeders there in Russia, and then eventually they were released outside of Russia. But this was considered Stalin's dog, a national breed treasure, and something um, that they were very proud of. Um, I've heard them called the Russian Pearl, um, Stalin's dog, a lot of uh, Black Pearl of Russia, lots of very endearing terms to describe a very formidable dog. Mm -hmm. The dog was used for a lot of different jobs, but everything was working. This was not a companion in any way. Before they had these uh, very long luxury coats that we see today, 
Um, they were used by the military police, and they were used at border crossings, and they were used for border patrol. And they were used as facility dogs as well. So let's say the facility could have been a military institution or a prison or a chemical plant or, or a food storage facility, manufacturing, things like that. Everything was about protecting Russia's resources. So, you know, here it is at the end of the day, and everybody's, you know, either gone home or been in their cells and doors locked, etc. The handler would take that black Russian and release it loose in the facility. It wasn't working with a handler. It was working completely independently, and its entire job was to neutralize anything that moved. Wow. You know, so this place was shut down. It was quiet. There should be no one there. So if something's moving, it's a threat. Job neutralized. So literally it was born and bred to take care of any threat. And I say neutralized because it was everything from guard and hold to take it down. Mm-hmm. You know, so um, the Russian dogs have a very different way of guarding and protecting that's unlike any of the other protection breeds that I've had the privilege to work around. Um, if they're barking, then they're enjoying themselves. This is about fun. Hey, look, I see a threat. And watch me scare it. It's when they don't bark that you should be afraid. <laughs> that's, that's when it's real. Right. Um, these guys literally silent and deadly. Um, if there's a true threat, you didn't get an alert, a bark, a growl. They immediately charged to it and neutralized it. Um, when I had my first black Russian and Dobermans at the same time, and they are out there in the yard, you know, working together, playing together, learning these guard games together as dogs do. Um, you can see how the Dobermans work. And they bark and alert, and they create a barrier around whatever they're guarding. And it's very obvious what they're doing with their job. The, the black Russian would sort of sit quietly to the side and wait until the Doberman wasn't looking huh. or wasn't giving eye contact. And then very quietly, very quickly, a dead run, hit that dog broadside with its chest and just bowl it over. Boom, 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 boom. Huh. And you'd see the Doberman, you know, yelp when it got hit and then just kind of lay there for a minute, you know, catching its breath, uh-huh. getting the wind knocked out of it. And, and the black Russian standing over it, very happy, tail wagging, you know, look what I did. Mm-hmm. <laughs> As you're watching this, and you're like, my gosh, that is a completely different way of working. All right. And you hear anecdotal stories from people. Um, the meter guy went in the backyard, you know, or I didn't anticipate him to. Well, the dog didn't hurt him in any way but the owner comes home from work and uh somebody hears a car roll up and you hear from the backyard help you know <laughs> and uh, the owner walks out there and the dog's got him pinned up against the fence he may have been there for a few hours <laughs> <laughs> you know, he didn't need him he didn't do anything but he stopped the threat you're not getting in my house and you're not leaving either so it's it's kind of exciting to see how they work and hear some of the stories of, of what they do. Mm-hmm. Um, but we did, you know, continue breeding them to be more of companion dogs. Um, and we did continue to breed them for these beautiful coats. And that just left them um, with a handicap as far as real work goes. Um, Mm -hmm. they did get bigger. They've definitely gotten larger and heavier since they were originally bred. And that reflects some changes that we see in the standard and the coat and the, and the furnishings and the show cuts have definitely gotten more dramatic. So it's no longer, um, exciting for police work. It's certainly much heavier than some of the shepherds and Malinois breeds. Um, so it's, it's not really efficient for doing certain things in police work. Um, the coat requires so much more maintenance. Again, that makes it less desirable for police work. Um, I do know several dogs that do search and rescue work and tracking, and they're very good at it. But again, with this amount of coat maintenance, um, having to groom out and shave between their feet, worrying about stickers and briars and all kinds of things as they're you know, trotting off through a field or the woods, just requires so much more maintenance than several other breeds who can also do the job so we don't see these guys being used professionally as a job as a dog with a job but 
um, they still have the desire and the aptitude. So it's our job to find jobs for them. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's our responsibility to find things that they like to do that they can do. Are they, um, is there any that are, are participating in, in some canine sports or? Yeah, we do. Um, we don't see too many in agility. Right. And as you can imagine, um, because they are so heavy, um, it doesn't necessarily lend itself to the dog. But well-built dogs certainly can do agility. They're not quite as fast as many of the other breeds. Um, some of the agility course is narrow, and that makes it a little different for a very wide dog. <laughs> so, right. um, you know, these guys are pretty big. Um, obedience work, yes, and rally work, yes. Those are both obedience competitions. And they do quite well at that. Um, again, some do search and rescue work. Uh, having to keep their coats maintained is a little bit of a deterrent. Some do tracking work. And this is all, all things that they really enjoy. Um, uh, several of them I know have tried herding. Um, they're good at it, but it really does depend on some of the lines have a higher prey drive than mm-hmm. others. Mm-hmm. So um, some of them might just really enjoy chasing the livestock, and I can't tell you what would happen at the end So <laughs> <laughs> without supervision. So we don't have that many doing herding work, but some of them are quite capable. Uh, some of them do lure coursing, which is kind of fun, and fast cat is a new um, sport that they do as well. Uh, a lot of them are very strong swimmers. There's at least one kennel back east that has competed with the Newfoundlands for uh, water retrieval mm. and water rescue. Uh, there's a really neat video on YouTube in Italy. They have a lot of lakes, so water rescue in lakes is a big deal and they use dogs for that and they use everything from portuguese water dogs to labradors to black russians wow. and you'll see them uh getting dropped out of a helicopter um, hovering over the water and uh, bringing a buoy over to a swimmer and helping that swimmer back to shore that's another really cool uh, job that they have dock diving you'll see several of them doing it uh, they're just strong strong swimmers mm-hmm. and they do have a natural instinct to rescue um, so it is fun to have them in the pool. We have a pool, and we definitely enjoy water retrieval and pretend rescue. <laughs> <laughs> Do some of them uh, um, excel in some bite sports? So not quite as much. Um, it's hit or miss there. Mm-hmm. W- one of the reasons that these dogs don't do some of the IPO shits in sports is because it is hard to bring that bite drive out in them. Mm-hmm. Um, when you when you see uh, dogs working with the flirt pole, other breeds, you really see that level of intensity. These guys are about conserving energy, and I don't mean that in a lazy way. Mm-hmm. Um, although they certainly do make good couch potatoes. Um, <laughs> but but uh, when when they were born and, and bred to work, they didn't go to work for you know an hour or thirty minutes. It wasn't a trial. Mm-hmm. It was a day or 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 many hundreds of miles where they were patrolling a border. So they were really built to cover ground, strong reach, uh, far reach, and strong drive from the rear. Um, very well angled and balanced, and conserving that energy. So if they were working for several hours before they needed that burst to go and neutralize, they were able to do so. Um, the shits and sports with the bite, that's just about creating a frenzy and getting them to react to something immediately. So, yes, you can teach them to hit the sleeve. Yes, you can teach them to, you know, hit the body suit and all of that. Um, it is hard on the um, it is hard on the person in the suit because these dogs are so strong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> they won't want it, don't want to do too much. But it is hard to bring that out in them. So I've seen a few that really enjoy bite work, and I did have one that really enjoyed the bite work. But for the most part, they'll do what they're asked, but it's just not, hey, that's my idea. It's mm-hmm. not really their idea. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I did have some that would do fly ball and catch frisbees, but for the most part, no, that's not really their thing. Right. Um, so yes, you can see them getting over a six-foot fence, and yes, I definitely have one that would jump into the back of a vehicle and, and neutralize someone, but it's just not something that they're really excited to go do um when you get to like a a trial or uh, let's say you're even going to agility and you see the level of energy of the dogs and their intensity and the barking and that chaotic i want to go get it 
these dogs are not chaotic. They're not frenzied. They're not spastic. They're not chaotic. Everything is very controlled. So it's just, um, so yes, they'll do it. Um, but it's not quite something that they would say excel at. Um, mm-hmm. Right. And could you talk about the, the modern standard, standards today, like the AKC and the FCI? Sure, sure. Um, for the most part, our American standard models very closely the FCI standard. Um, the FCI standard was put back in place, I think, for the first time back in 1984. We formed our club in stud book, I believe, in 97, so that many years later. And then we weren't accepted into AKC until 2004. And we did go through a standard change that uh, was effective in July of 2009 that actually increased the size and density of the dog. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, um, our standard really focuses on their ability to do their work. So Mm -hmm. in everything that we describe, it's about a dog that's well-balanced, proportions and angles. It makes sense because being developed by the Russian military with scientists involved, there would be a a lot of um, angles and statistics and proportions that would be important to them. And that goes into the development of the dog, and that that comes around to what we created. Um, For the males, and we consider maturity over 18 months because growth plates have closed. Many of them still do grow after 18 months and maybe physically fully mature closer to three years but we consider um, looking at maturity over 18 months and the height that the withers they want between 27 and 30 inches tall with Mm -hmm. that desired height between 27 and 29. If you were going to a dog show today you'd see many dogs in there that are 30 and over. Mm -hmm. It's acceptable um, as long as the dog's proportions are held. So as long as those proportions are there, you can have larger exhibits. But that's sort of the height range. For females, again, over 18 months old, that height, uh, desired height is between 26 and 29 inches tall with the sweet spot between 26 and 28. And you will still see females a little bit over that in the ring. Again, it's okay as long as they're well balanced. Um, They're not a square dog. They're a little bit longer than they are tall. And the females can be up to 10% longer um, than their height. And that's just to accommodate um, the breeding purpose. Um, But they are large boned. Um, They're a molluscer breed. They should be wide and dense, um, well muscled all the way down the lower leg. Dogs that are a little bit too wide might be a little slower. So it's not overly developed and overly muscled. This is, again, a large breed, not a giant breed. Uh, The head has to be in proportion to the body, giving that appearance of power and strength. And the length of the neck is not less than 40% of the height of the dog at the withers. And we want that large head and longer neck. You'll see some dogs with kind of a football neck, a little shorter neck, not quite as desired because that head carriage then won't be true. They'll drop their head, and then in doing so, you start to lose um, the amount of ground that they can cover. That reach and drive are really important, so sort of everything is is built on their ability to cover ground. They should have really strong pigment, a black pigment, a black nose, black ring around the eyes. Their gums are black, um, very strong dark black coat. You will see guard hairs in that coat that are wiry silver. And that's acceptable. You can have up to 30%, but not in any discernible pattern. So you don't want to see blazes, patches, and spots. There are black Russians that have come in other colors. And that would be sort of a throwback to some of the original breeds, as you can imagine. The Airedale Terrier has Mm -hmm. a saddle pattern. Mm -hmm. Um, The Rottweiler is a black and tan dog. We do color testing to help ensure that we're breeding dogs who are phenotypically black, meaning visually black. But the genotype can be different, and they do carry different color patterns that are hidden underneath that black coat. Mm -hmm. Every now and then, um, before we were doing a lot of color testing, you might accidentally have bred two dogs together that didn't have that dominant black gene. So you would see a black and tan puppy here and there. Um, 
that is something that those dogs use can still register. They're still purebred, but we don't see them in the confirmation ring in the FCI or in AKC, only uh, black dogs, because that was the original purpose, breeding a dog that was nearly invisible at night, even to the extent that they had a fall over their eyes, so you couldn't see the reflection of their eyes in the dark. Mm -hmm. um, any, co any color pattern would sort of void that original purpose of the dog, so that's not something that we breed to or breed for. Um, so uh, as far as weight, um, there are some dogs that are a little bit lighter, some dogs that are heavier. Um, average for females is probably around 100 pounds. Average for males is probably around 120. Knowing that there's still dogs that are 80 pounds and there's dogs that are 160 pounds. You know, we can always find examples of larger Again, as long as the dog can move well, is well balanced with the angles in the front and the back, mm -hmm. has that strong reach and drive, then the oversized is okay. Undersized is a little less desirable. Um, these dogs should be highly intelligent, trainable, um, and we do see them in public sometimes being friendly let's say we've got a, a meet the breeds or an education opportunity we'll pick kind of the top one percent of dogs that are friendly with strangers mm -hmm. in general that's not the breed so it's it's fun to go and see the breed and meet them and you're like oh my god these are little you know big black bears and you just want to give them a hug but remember that's the one percent the majority of them are not friendly with strangers nor should they be mm -hmm. Um, most, these are not what I would consider dog park dogs. Um, I do see, I do have friends, you know, and I do see dogs and I have bred puppies that are more than capable of doing that type of social work, but it's the exception, not the rule. In general, they don't like strangers. Mm -hmm. They're not going to do anything bad to them or eat them or growl at them or bite them or something like that, but they don't have a use for them. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, one of the dogs that I had taken, one of the older girls I had taken to the breed booth. She's great with strangers, great with people, but she's not friendly. She just, I don't, you know, they can exist and that's fine. I don't have a use for them. So when people would come up to the booth, she would just sit and turn her back to them. <laughs> that was ah, her opinion. Hmm. You know, I'm not interested. Right. Um, whereas one of the one of the boys and usually the puppies are super friendly and they want to give hugs and get butt scratches and pets and all that stuff. And I love that we have examples that we can bring out there so people can safely meet the breed. But it's not it's not generally how they should be. Mm -hmm. um, I I get people asking, unfortunately, frequently, um, can I can I get a dog for service work? I want a dog for. Um, my mobility assist dog or I want a service dog because I have this disease or condition and I'm telling you that they're absolutely capable of doing any and all jobs but they probably shouldn't or at least most of them shouldn't mm -hmm. um, you know for example um, someone using a dog for PTSD I'm sure it is a big comfort to have a very large imposing dog there um, to kind of fill in that gap and help someone with the difficulties of being in a public situation. But let's say that person had a panic attack and maybe passersby wouldn't know that it's not a heart attack mm -hmm. or something. So here the person is going to lay on the ground or go to the ground and the dog is going to go with them and guard them. Mm -hmm. Well, how is it when a first responder is trying to come in and render aid? You know, we put both the Good Samaritan, a first responder, and the dog at risk. Right. And God forbid there's actual medical emergency, then the person on the ground who we can't render aid to could be at risk as well. Mm -hmm. So I, so we do see them as service dogs, but it is the exception and not the rule um, as, as far as that goes. And then as far as a mobility assist dog, um, our breed, like many other large breed, um, does has el have elbow dysplasia and hip dysplasia. So if you think about, you know, the first two years of your dog is going into training and at 24 months you're able to finally get the hips and the elbows uh, x-rayed and graded and let's say they pass. So now you've got a two-year-old dog that you know is capable of being a mobility assist dog. That's great. But by seven, even the dog that passes all of its tests might start showing signs of osteoarthritis because of the size 
large bone. Mm -hmm. Um, Maybe maybe you get five years of service out of a dog that, let's say it was your mobility assist dog, and now it needs mobility assistance, but you can't do that (laughs) because because you're the one that needed it. And then who's going to help? You know, who's helping the dog to get up and get outside and get the exercise when he's starting to break down. Mm -hmm. So it it kind of, I see people do it and that's great, but you do end up with a retired dog that might need more assistance than you can physically give. So these are things to consider when, when people are looking for um, dogs as service dogs. There are a few breeders in North America, some uh, one or two in Canada and, and a few in the States that have successfully um, bred several service dogs, and usually if I get a request or someone talks to me about that, I ask them to go and talk with those breeders. Right. I, it's not something that I would recommend. I do have a few of my puppies that have gone on to do therapy work, but it's the needle in the haystack. You have to find that dog. It's an exception. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Can you uh, talk more about maybe some of the other health issues that you sure. found with the breed? Sure, absolutely. Um, I think we've, we're very similar to a lot of large breed dogs in that the majority of problems are related to the heart due to the depth of chest, mm-hmm. um, the, the hips, and the elbows, and that has a lot to do with the weight of the dog. Um, good structure, well-bred dog will have better structure and therefore put less weight on the joints um, and, and it just comes down to kinetics and, and how exactly the uh, weight is distributed from the hip all the way through to the ground. A dog that's too straight in the rear is going to put a lot of pressure on that patella and you'll end up with this ACL surgeries um, or hip dysplasia. Um, dogs that have a straighter shoulder are going to put more pressure on those pasterns in the front and that weakens them over time or puts, puts pressure on the elbows and they start to bow out. Those dogs will break down more quickly. Um, At two years old, we recommend that dogs have their hips done and sent to the orthopedic foundation for animals for grade. Um, Veterinarians will take hips, uh, hip x-rays and elbow x-rays, but if they're not done in the exact position that OFA requires, then you may not get a true reading. Um, Your vet may say it looks good, but it, it may or may not be so we sort of use the OFA as our sort of guardian of what those hips and elbows look like conformationally on an x-ray. We grade those at two years old, 24 months. Other countries, uh, particularly for people that are importing from different countries, you'll see elbows done at 12 months old and hips done at 18 months. Um, in, in the States, we require that at two years old. And uh, three different veterinarians at the OFA will certify the hips. We have about 40% of the breed has hip dysplasia. That percentage could be higher because people generally don't send in um, hips that don't pass, unfortunately. Um, Elbow dysplasia is in about 30% of our breed, but again, it could be higher because people won't send in uh, elbows that don't pass, which is kind of a shame uh, because the identity of the dog doesn't have to be known. And they don't charge to evaluate x-rays that aren't passing. Mm -hmm. They just help go into our breed statistics so we get a better idea of health. So it's a shame that people don't, and I encourage them to do that. Um, Cardiac auscultation is something your regular vet does. They listen to the heart. They don't hear a murmur. At 12 months of age, we can certify the heart. Um, I like to see it done again a little bit later, particularly on breeding dogs. If you have an opportunity to have the heart listened to by a cardiologist, that's also a bonus or an echocardiogram done. Those are all really good things. Uh, We do have heart disease in the breed, but again, people don't pass. They don't send in their tests, so it looks like less than 1% of our breed has heart problems. The heart problems that we've seen cropping up most recently have been related to uh, diet Uh, feeding grain-free kibble diets, and that is definitely a problem in our breed, and there's a lot of research going on right now to find out exactly why that is, so we don't recommend grain-free diets Mm. for this breed. Um, The uh, eye exams, we we also send to uh, the OFA. 
We generally do that after one year of age. I like to have my whole litter evaluated at eight weeks. Um, cataracts are something that happen in the breed, and there are a few other eye issues that can crop up. These are species-specific dogs right. in general get right. um, eye issues. So it's nice to have that evaluation and make sure. Um, we believe there's a hereditary component to um, cardiac uh, sorry, to, uh, um, to uh, cataracts, mm -hmm. but we but we don't know that because there's not a specific test for it, so you may see cataracts sporadically, um, not you know, showing up in some bloodlines and not in others, but we don't have a lot of evaluations and we don't really have any way to say it is genetic or not, so we, we don't have a really good study there, but I do recommend getting the eye exams done. Um, PRA is... Um, progressive retinal atrophy that can lead to night blindness. This is an issue in our breed. Uh, we've recently been able to identify the genetic variant that's responsible for this. It is a simple recessive, so a dog carrying one copy of the gene will not develop PRA. A dog with two copies of the gene is genetically disposed to PRA, um, so we can do genetic testing to look for that. Um, I haven't seen it cropping up here in the United States, at least in the last 15 or 20 years. I haven't seen it reported. We do see carriers from time to time, but I haven't seen the actual disease or condition reported. Um, some of the other things that we test for are genetic um, JLPP, it's juvenile laryngeal paralysis and polyneuropathy. This is a disease that is unique to um, the Rottweiler and the Black Russian Terrier. Mm -hmm. Um, there may be different variants for polyneuropathy in other breeds, but it is a unfortunately fatal. So having one copy of the gene is no risk to the dog. Having two copies of the gene is fatal. Most puppies won't survive past four to six months. Wow. Um, and for the most part, um, they'll be humanely euthanized before that. Right. Um, we, we only got the test developed through a lot of uh, fundraising and extensive research. The uh, University of Missouri did the gene mapping for us, and we were able to identify the variant. So now we have that variant, and worldwide testing is being done. And the idea is to eventually eliminate that gene from the dogs altogether. Um, but we are able to safely breed around it and not create affected puppies, so we don't go through that, that tragedy. Um, there's also a DNA test for, uh, we call it HU, or hyperuricosuria. And this is um, when dogs are affected, they don't uh, process um, urine the same way that uh, other dogs do, and they're predisposed to getting bladder stones, hmm. which can be, it, it can be fatal if there's an actual blockage in the urethra for a male dog, usually it's the worst, um, and there are surgeries um, to correct that, and they're pretty painful and horrific, so... Ideally, we just don't produce dogs that can be affected. Um, not all affected dogs develop stones, and we don't know what the penetrance is for that. Um, let's say it's less than 10% or more than 20%. We really don't know. We don't have good studies on that. It's a disease condition that is in Rottweilers, or sorry, in uh, Dalmatians and in Bulldogs as well. Um, they may have better statistics on the actual percentage that develop stones, mm -hmm. but the only way to avoid it is just don't breed carrier-to-carrier -carrier dogs. Mm -hmm. um, some, some breeders still do it in the United States and otherwise uh, outside the United States. It's not something I would do. Um, so it's something that um, puppies should, puppy buyers should definitely ask about the status of the dogs before they're purchased. Um, there are other tests that are done, uh, thyroid tests, patellas, these are things that are optional. Our breed club in the United States has asked breeders to test for the color variants, um, the K locus, which is our dominant black, and the Goody locus, which shows um, what pattern could be um, produced if the dominant black isn't present. So we require that to get our um, canine health um, certificate. For breeding, but um, not everybody does it, and certainly not not necessary if you're not breeding. Mm -hmm. um, that's not something you have to do. But that those are the screenings that we should look for um, when looking for a puppy. 
making sure that the parents have been tested. Interesting. Sure. Um, so this is kind of funny. Um, you'll hear stories from some of the older uh, Russian breeders or even mm. some of the younger Russians. Um, their first floor would be what we would consider the second floor. So their flats are on the second floor. Uh-huh. And uh, they talked about carrying their puppies up and down the stairs for the first year of their life. <laughs> and, the, and the reason was um, because of the joints and the amount of weight these right. puppies um, can be 25, 30 pounds at eight, nine weeks old and can be between 70 and 100 pounds at six months. And you can imagine carrying these dogs up and down stairs, which sort of cracks me up. Right. But yes, um, ideally they're not doing stairs until they're a year old. And we just want their joints to have an optimum opportunity to mm-hmm. grow and strengthen. They're big and heavy dogs and the ligaments and tendons are loose like rubber bands when they're younger. Um, and so they just don't have that muscle strength to create that better joint conformation. So you risk wear and tear. So yes, you can have a two-story house, but ideally the dogs are not going up and down stairs. Um, it's important that they learn to do stairs, but um, safely in just little bits at a time. Um, this is definitely an indoor dog. Uh, they bond very closely to their family, but remember they have a job to do. So even when you think they're not doing it, they're doing it. Mm-hmm. If you put this dog outside and give it you know a couple acres to roam um you're telling it hey what's important to you is out there i want you to focus outside Mm -hmm. and they're not really going to focus on you and inside and not necessarily bond as closely with you Um, there are other guardian breeds that are better for guarding your property like that Mm -hmm. we've bred these guys to be companions and they want to be inside with us so the ideal situation is they are inside with us Mm -hmm. Um, crate training for me is something that is a necessity and I think it's irresponsible if you don't and this has nothing to do with I don't want to chew myself or go to the bathroom on the floor this has to do with we live in California um, and we have natural disasters Um, wildfires are a reality earthquakes are a reality Mm -hmm. if for any reason and this this works really for for almost any place in the country if for any reason you had to your home was compromised, let's say, from an earthquake, Mm -hmm. and now we don't have a door or we don't have windows or whatever. You want to be able to safely secure your dog, any dog, so crate training would be safe. If it's a wildfire and you're caught, you have to evacuate. Whether you're going to a shelter or a hotel, if you go to a shelter, you will have to have your dog in a crate. Mm -hmm. Um, Some of the worst wildfires we had here a few years ago, and I was bringing water and food and resources to one of the shelters. People were sitting in their cars outside in 110 degree heat. They've run out of gas, so they can't run the air conditioner, but they can't go inside with their dog and they can't leave it outside alone because it would die in a hot car and they didn't have crates. So if they'd had a crate, they would have been able to put their dog in the gymnasium, air-conditioned with water, safely. And instead, they're outside in the worst air quality with ash and soot floating around. Bad for them, bad for their dogs, mm-hmm. horrible heat, and no relief because they didn't have a crate or their dog wasn't crate trained. So this is something that I find a necessity, and I, I think that everybody should do it regardless of where they live. Mm-hmm. It's, not a, it's not a bad thing have a large crate i mean we have great dane size crates for these guys 54 by 48 it's overkill it's huge it's got a big orthopedic pad in it but they consider that a great place to take a nap and they're more than happy to go in there and i can pack that thing up fold flat take it anywhere i need to go set it up and i have a safe place for my dog Mm -hmm. so for for people who are like you know i'm in a rental and i just can't you know risk that my puppy might chew on the baseboard until it's completely trained you know teach it to to use a crate this Mm -hmm. is something that they should do but dogs should be inside Um, air conditioning is great in uh, colder climates people have the uh, heated floors your black russian is not going to thank you for that it probably was going to really enjoy being outside Um, i've had uh, litters in the winter time and it's 18 degrees out and these puppies want to run out and go to the bathroom at six weeks old, and they don't care how cold it is. Mm-hmm. I'm out there freezing, holding mm-hmm. coffee, and trying, you know, freezing, and, and they're <laughs> loving it, running around, just enjoying the cold. Um, 
but uh, they uh, they definitely are are very close to us. They might get up on the bed at night and then five minutes later say, gosh, it's hot, and then go lay on the cold tile floor in the bathroom. I've heard people telling me their dog sleeps in the bathtub because <laughs> it's an old iron tub and it's nice and cool. Um, air conditioning is really important. Fresh water, obviously, mm-hmm. very, very important. My dogs think the swimming pool is their water bowl, and, you know, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's fine, too. Um but uh, they can handle pretty much any climate. They just want to be inside with you, and they want to be comfortable. Right. So um, a lot of people think that shaving the dog down is uh, will help it stay cooler, and that actually is sort of the opposite. If you shave it too closely down, you're taking away its ability to control the climate around its body. Mm-hmm. Cutting, cutting excess hair is great, um, making sure... It's clean around the eyes and the ears and the feet and the, the rear. Then, you know, those are great places to keep the hair short uh, for comfort and keeping the coat shorter. But shaving it down really isn't the right answer. I bet you've become an expert on uh, grooming, huh? I, <laughs> well, uh, no, I can <laughs> do it. <laughs> I can do it. and uh, But I'm told I'm terrible, so that's fine, too. But, uh <laughs> For most people, I actually highly recommend that they learn to groom their own dogs. Right. Um, this is a breed that has to be groomed for its entire life, whether it's six weeks old or you know ten years old. It has to be groomed. So this is something that, as a breeder, I start in the whelping box using just a little mustache shaver when mm-hmm. they're three days old. We're putting the shaver on their body so they can feel the vibrations and mm-hmm. sound. Sound is vibration. Um, so a little puppy that size, their eyes aren't open until they're two weeks old, and their ears aren't open until they're three weeks old. So they don't have really functional sight and hearing until they're a little more than three weeks old. So introducing nail clipping, um, dremels, and shavers into the whelping box when they're very young is a great thing to do. So by the time their eyes are open, there's no mystery to what this vibrating thing looks like. And by the time they can hear, that sound isn't surprising at all because they've been feeling that Mm -hmm. the entire time. And as soon as they're able to stand, we start standing them on a grooming table. This has nothing to do with showing. This is obviously not a table breed. Nobody's going to run around the ring and then put it up on a grooming table to look at it. But... Every single time a dog is groomed, it has to stand on a grooming table. It has to learn to stand still on a grooming table for any groomer. For you, frankly, I like uh, washing them up on that grooming table so I'm not bent over. My back's a little stiff as I've gotten older. Mm -hmm. So uh, we teach them to stand on a grooming table and tolerate everything, um, touching them all over. Um, But their hair grows really fast, so even if you weren't trying to keep a show cut, uh, you've got to keep the hair trimmed around the eyes. We use that little blunt nose scissors. You have to keep the hair trimmed around the rear for sanitation. You want to make sure that's clean and nothing sticks back there. You've got to keep the hair trimmed around the ears for good air circulation so they're not getting too much moisture buildup, which can lead to overgrowth of yeast or bacterial infections, etc. And you have to keep the feet shaved out. Um, they do have webbed feet. And the hair between their feet, between the pads underneath, grows very quickly, very long. And they'll be slipping and sliding all over the floor if you don't keep that shaved down so that the pads can touch the floor. Mm -hmm. Um, So we do that, like I said, when they're three days old, we start shaving their feet out. As far as the, the patterns and the grooming and all of that, it's something you can learn. Their hair grows really fast. You start with what the basics are. Um, get the grooming table, get some scissors, get some clippers. I try to help my puppy people find, you know, just the right tools so they can start doing this at home. The second any groomer hears the size of your dog and the breed of the dog, the first thing out of their mouth is is $200. (laughs) That's what they want, $200. So when you're talking about a, a, a breed that at the, if you want to stretch it every two or three months needs a groom, uh, yeah, it adds up. This no. is expensive. So learn to do the basics at home. Yeah. It's so much easier when you can do a lot of this. It's a bonding experience for you and your dog. Puppy coats need to be brushed nearly daily because it's a lot of puppy fluff. 
and it mats quickly. Mm-hmm. Once that adult coat starts coming in, you can do this, you know, every few days, once a week. I've got adults that you can do once a week, once every two weeks, and no problem. But maintaining it is the key. And if you can learn to do it yourself, you'll save yourself a fortune. Mm-hmm. And I have every picture you can imagine of every bad grooming job possible. <laughs> and some of those were in the show ring, and some of them were just at home. But it, it's it's hair. Mm-hmm. It's hair. It grows. Um their hair doesn't grow to a certain length and stop. You know, shepherds, their hair gets two, three inches long and it stops growing. You continue to let a black Russian's hair grow. It'll be five, six, seven, eight. I mean, it keeps growing like your hair. You don't cut it. It's just going to grow. So uh, it grows quickly. And the more you brush it, the faster it grows. So why not, you know, go ahead and do some bad haircuts. Mm-hmm. Get creative and, and learn to do it. You know, yourself, I've, I've gotten to the point where I can put a certain blade on the clipper and run over sort of the silhouette of the dog and make it make it look sort of like a show, show groom, but shorter. And I don't have to get the scissors out and make a whole shebang out of it. Right. Because, you know, the show groom, if you're seriously doing this from start to finish, you're going to spend an hour washing the dog because it's got so much hair. They'll spend an hour or two just drying it out, blowing it out properly, and probably three hours scissoring. I don't do it all in one day. Mm-hmm. But uh, for, for a pet family, if you're keeping up on this stuff, you know, you can brush through that coat in 10 or 15 minutes. You can do, uh, you know, the nails and the feet and uh, kind of those ears, rears, and and, uh, and feet every, every week or so and bathe them once – a month they don't really get dirty um they don't smell like a lot of other breeds dobermans were stinky mm-hmm. uh, shep- shepherds tend to be stinky these guys not so much every now and then you'll find one that's got a little different makeup or whatever but for the most part they don't smell much and uh, keeping them brushed and cleaned out and really only a bath once a month or so and it'll save you a fortune mm-hmm. definitely well definitely and they don't they don't usually shed that much right no, they don't. Well, they're considered a non-shedding breed, but that doesn't mean there won't be hair. Right. So um, they have a double coat, kind of a soft undercoat, it's more of a cottony that provides kind of that dense buffer, and then that top outer coat. Um, so what we typically do is rake the coat and pull out a lot of that cottony undercoat. Not mm-hmm. all of it, but mm-hmm. a lot. Um, they don't necessarily need it in our hot weather, but it helps it not uh, mat as quickly. If you don't comb and brush out that undercoat, it will come out. So it doesn't seasonally shed or blow coat like other breeds, but the hair does come out. Um, so let's say if I had a Labrador swimming in my swimming pool, um, there'd be a layer of hair all over the top of the water. Right. Um, and that would get all caught in the filters and my pool guy would hate me. Um, That'd be my husband. But uh, when these guys go swimming, um, I say there's a poodle at the bottom of the pool. It's just a little ball of kind of fluffy, soft undercoat that right. sort of balls up in literally a ball down at the bottom. Huh. And it doesn't really float around. So same thing in the house. Um, you won't find hair on my clothes or on the couch, but there'll be a dust bunny in the corner that's a ball of black, soft undercoat all balled up together right right so 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 they don't shed per se but they still do lose hair Mm -hmm. um some people call them hypoallergenic i don't um but they have hair not fur like other breeds so they have hair and people who are allergic to dogs tend to have fewer allergies related to the black russian Mm -hmm. but but remember if you have allergies environmental allergies you know dust mold pollen you know grass whatever um that's going to stick to their coat when they go out and come in when they come in so you know you might not be allergic to your dog but that doesn't mean you're not going to have allergens in your house so you know how hypoallergenic is it really right right for sure yeah now how do they do with um other dogs and say cats um so it depends on the dog um we have uh, had shih tzus in the past and cats um, and a couple of the black russians no problem don't care you guys can coexist it means nothing actually the little shih tzu sheila was in charge 
She <laughs> ruled the roost. Um, she let them all know. But um, some of them want to chase. So some of them have a higher prey drive. Mm -hmm. So it just, it does depend on the dog. Um, I look at the dogs that are more terrier type tend to have a little higher energy and a higher prey drive. But that's just my observation anecdotal. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily a breed observation overall. Um, there'll be some feral cats out in the yard from time to time. And as long as they just sit still and look at the dogs, there's no chase. If they run across the yard, then there's a possibility they'll chase. Mm -hmm. um, I don't consider these guys dog park dogs because they're not social that way. But one of the reasons that they're not great, you know, say pack dogs with other dogs is because of their coat. It's very difficult to read body languages. Dogs communicate through their body language and their eyes. Mm -hmm. And you don't see that so much with a black Russian because of the coat you don't see those little micro expressions and with the fall over their eyes even if it's tied up you don't really see that with their eyes either so it's hard to know what they're thinking and that makes it difficult for other dogs um, that might be a little more suspicious hey I can't read you I'm not sure are you a threat so that dog sort of acts like a threat and then your black Russian responds to that so it's not necessarily that they're not great with other dogs it does have a lot to do with the other dog um, so there are plenty that get along with other dogs, and there are a few that don't. Mm -hmm. And I can I can say a lot of it has to do with their ability to to read that body language. Um, but it is something also that you can train into them. Um, you work with them socially. Um, why did you choose the Black Russian Terrier, and um, how long have you had this breed? Sure. Uh, we've had the Black Russian Terrier, had one in my home since 2009. We made the decision to get one in two. Yeah, well, and I, I can't say I blame them for that because, you know, the truth is in, in some some dogs, the temperament that's needed for working mm -hmm. wouldn't be suitable for um, the confirmation ring. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that they couldn't do some of those things as long as they're getting all those experiences for their dogs that's great yeah um in, in, in some breeds there's a clear discrepancy between what's in the show ring and, and what can work right. and frankly the dogs that are in the show ring couldn't work mm -hmm. i mean you can just you can just see it and you wouldn't you would know it um it's obvious we don't really have that distinction so much with black russians mm -hmm. um but we want to be able to preserve their working ability. That that has a lot to, to do with their intelligence. But let's face it, there's not that many out there and there's not that many people that are going to say, I want to do this sport with a dog. Mm -hmm. Oh, and by the way, they're not necessarily really well suited for bite work. They're not really well motivated or not always that motivated to do that type of frenzied intensity. Mm -hmm. So you can do those sports and you can show... I say take the take the best of both worlds if you can. I definitely understand why people don't like it um, right. and and are against it, but I can't say I would rule it out. Right. Um, How much success have you had in the uh, show ring? I think we've done pretty well. Um, everybody has finished their championships. A few have gone on to grand championships. I've put grand championships on myself. I've used handlers for it as well. Um, I have bred by champions. Um, my oldest boy, who was my first black Russian, when he was, uh, he finished very young. And my handler uh, said, hey, bring him out again when he's mature, mentally mature. But he, he never did. He was, still, yeah. <laughs> he was still the giant goofball puppy, um, which was kind of exciting. So when he was uh, seven years old, we brought him back out, which is really old for a black Russian. Um, and he showed for that year and ended up uh, top five in the country and invited to Westminster and finished his bronze grand championship at seven. He was the, he is still the oldest black Russian to be invited to Westminster. Wow. And no, I did not take him because that is a long trip for an older guy in a plane or a car. That just doesn't seem very nice. <laughs> so, right. No, um, for me, it's about the health of the dog. I enjoy showing. Uh, in California, we have lots of outdoor shows. In the summertime, it can be 100-something degrees. 
Um, so if it's not okay for a puppy, I'm not going to drive them around the show ring. You know, mm-hmm. that's kind of crazy. But uh, a lot of these guys really love it. The second I touch a show lead, they're excited. They want to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, my oldest boy, like I said, the shows for him, he never really matured mentally, physically, yes, but not mentally. And he thinks shows are a party thrown in his honor and the food is all for him. You know, <laughs> he, he'd do anything for, for food. So he loves it. Um, dogs that don't like it, I don't make them do it. You know, they don't all love the same thing. And if they don't have the aptitude for it, no matter how beautiful they are, why make them do it? Right, right. What is the average life expectancy? Well, we'd like to say 10 to 14 years. Um, It's it's, uh, the rare dog that you see getting to 14. Mm -hmm. Um, Usually by age nine, even the best dogs... Uh, have got some osteoarthritis setting in either the lower back or the hips. Um, so they really start slowing down. Let's face it, after seven, they're starting to break down. So um, mm-hmm. one of the reasons I love swimming with these dogs is it's a great uh, exercise even you know when they can't really take the impact. Um, I use a treadmill for my dogs uh, because of the heat here Mm -hmm. it's easy for us to get up early in the morning um, and do some treadmill work and even in the heat of the day under shade do a little bit of treadmill work so they maintain that stamina even in the warm weather Um, but you wouldn't be able to walk on the pavement so that's you you know you wouldn't be able to take your dog for a walk so having the treadmill is a a big help but uh, having them be able to swim is a is a great way to get exercise uh, mm. in this in the heat, but also to, as they get older. Um, things that typically take out our black Russians, um, I've heard of different cancers. Some are specific to black dogs. Uh, toe cancer is a big thing in black dogs. has to do with the pigmentation. Wow. Uh, giant, giant schnauzers uh, have a big issue with that as well. Of course, we have the same breed. Um the uh, kidney issues, and I'm not sure why, um, but there's been a lot of dogs that have had kidney issues later in life, um, not related to the HU gene, but uh, different, just straight with the kidney. Um, breaking down, uh, the osteoarthritis um, being an issue. Uh, when you have a dog that's you know weighing 120 plus pounds um, and you can't get them up on their feet to go to the bathroom, quality of life is kind of not there. So. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, there's some condition that um, seems to be neurological in origin, but uh, definitely causes some weakness in the rear, particularly as the dogs age. So uh, I started seeing it in my 11-year-old earlier this year, um, but I've seen it much worse, and we're not really sure what that's about, but... Um, they definitely get some weakness back there. So, you know, a lot of dogs you'll hear passing away at 9 and 10 years old. Rarely you hear some that are 13 and 14. Mm-hmm. But I can't I can't tell you that it was a great quality of life. So, you know, overall, the larger the dog, um, the shorter the lifespan. And uh, mm-hmm. to, to have a good quality life, you want them to be well-muscled and in good physical condition as long as you can. Right. Definitely. Okay. Well, I definitely appreciate your time, and uh, uh, I'll keep you posted, and um, maybe we can do this again in the the future. Sure. Sounds great. Uh Thank you, Sean, for doing this. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Bye. All right. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.